Coming up on All About Android, it's me, Jason Howell, Florence Ion, Ron Richards, and we welcome our guest, Eric Mijakovsky, who is the creator of Beeper, which is an app that actually you know, brings a lot of chat apps into one interface but it also brings iMessage to Android. Interesting stuff there. Also, we've got some more details, some more hints around some features that might be coming with Android 12. LG is mulling over a possible exit of the mobile phone uh, industry, essentially. An incredibly rugged email section and so much more next on All About Android. Twit's annual survey is still going strong, but not for long. You've got maybe a week, maybe even two weeks, but definitely very soon this survey is going to go away and we really want your feedback. So go to twit.tv slash survey 21. This really just helps us get a better understanding of what you're looking for, what you like about what we're doing, what you don't like about what we're doing, what you want to see more of. Uh, we keep it anonymous and you really only have to answer anything that you feel comfortable with. That's twit.tv slash survey 21. 21, and we appreciate it. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Udacity. Build your tech skills through industry-leading programs created and recognized by top companies worldwide with a nano degree from Udacity in as little as 12 weeks. Visit udacity.com slash twit and use coupon code twit at checkout to get 50% off through May 30th, 2021. Hello, welcome to All About Android, episode 509, recorded on Tuesday, January 26th, 2021. Your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. And I'm Florence Isle. Hello. Hello. Hello Man, your friends. video's looking so awesome today, Flo. You've got it nailed oh, in. Oh, thanks. I'm working on it. I do have to adjust this camera a bit, but I'll do it later. For for our audio listeners, Flo's uh, lighting situation is improved. Yeah, well, everybody's I just moved the light and I added, I don't know. I'm doing some stuff, guys. I got a blanket coming in. I got some new like lights. It's just... Listen, 2021 is all about improvement on all about Android. We're, <laughs> exactly. you know, I'm I'm slowly upgrading my space. Flo's upgrading her space. We're trying to match the high quality Jason provides for both video Correct. and audio quality for our audience. Uh, be yeah. sure to like and subscribe and tell your friends about all about Android. We appreciate it. Look, all you really have to do is move yourself into a corner, and then you can have what I have. It's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you so uh, super <laughs> <laughs> all of this can be yours. Uh, super excited to welcome our guest. We have a guest joining us for the first part of today's show, Eric Mijakovsky, who is the creator of an app that I saw exploding over the last week. We all did, uh, called Beeper. Also happens to be the former founder and CEO of Pebble. Eric, it's great to have you on tonight. Thank that you. It's me. <laughs> right on. It's good to see you. I hope uh, I hope everything's going well. Are you here in the Bay Area? Are you expecting this? Uh, what are they calling it? An atmospheric river to uh, hit your area? We'll see. We'll see. I am here in the Bay Area. <laughs> I'm in Palo Alto, but I grew up in Vancouver in Canada. So when people talk about rain here, I don't really believe them. You're like, yeah, right. Yeah, I know. Rain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just Vancouver the what they call is a place where lots of Lifetime movies were filmed. Uh, true, is that true story yeah i have the, no idea oh yeah yeah vancouver is a very well known uh tv not only paradise. lifetime films but also uh cw dramas and battlestar That's galactica true. Oh. yeah That's true. So, okay. and the X-Files. including revivals the cw or excuse me yep. uh bh 90210 yeah there you go uh all right so <laughs> we are thrilled to welcome you on not because of vancouver trivia but because of Beeper, no, we could do which is, that later. We could. We could. We kind of already did, I feel like. Uh, what What exactly is Beeper? Because, so, I mean, just to, just to preface this a little bit, obviously, you know, we've done 509 episodes of All About Android. I'd say about a third of those iMessage has come up in the discussion at some point as mm -hmm. relates to Android and the messaging mess that that the Android platform experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, this is uh, you're you're pretty familiar with this. So tell us a little bit about what Beeper is is and how it attempts to kind of solve some of those problems. So Beeper is a universal chat app. Uh, it merges 15 different chat networks into one app. 
Uh, it's an Android app, but it's also a desktop app and an iOS app. Um, so it, it is truly a universal chat app. I started working on it a couple of years ago, um, but I've been thinking about it for years. Uh, do you remember, like for, for those of us who um, don't mind dating themselves, if you remember like Trillion or Mebo, yes. oh, yeah. Adium, oh, Pigeon, I was a huge or, like, fan of these Trillion, apps. Yeah. Pigeon yeah, was my those. fave. Yeah, I was a Trillion oh. user when, when I was on PC anyways, but yeah. And so you remember the beauty of being able to have just one app with all of your friends, not having to think about, you know, which network did I text this person on? Where did I send this photo? Just one single interface to people. And that's what I wanted to replicate. And I had looked around for years. I tried some of the other ones. Like there's, you know, there's a few apps that, that let you kind of like open multiple Chrome tabs next to each other. But I wanted like a real app where I just had my contacts and they were next to each other and I could just talk and text and that was it. Um, I couldn't find it. So in 20, I guess it was 2019, a year, two years ago, I learned about this thing called Matrix, which is a new messaging protocol, an open source federated encrypted uh, messaging protocol. In some ways, it's kind of like the spiritual successor to XMPP or Jabber, which you may remember mm -hmm. powered Google Talk mm -hmm. and AOL. Oh, and yeah. I think uh, Facebook back back in the day. Yep. yep. Um, so Matrix is the new version. It's not a, it's not anything related to XMPP. It's completely new, but it is fantastic. And it's kind of, you know, you're hearing about it more on Hacker News and seeing it pop up. Um, well, I saw it two years ago. And the real the real thing that caught my attention is that Matrix the, the, the guys behind Matrix are really smart. They knew that building a new chat network, chat community, is, is really hard because you have to get your friends onto it first before it come, becomes valuable. So they, they thought ahead and they said, okay, so instead of like waiting for everyone to download it and you know you having to convince your parents to switch over until you know you could finally get your you know your family chat onto it, instead mm. of that, they built the ability to bridge Matrix to other existing chat networks. And, and what I mean by bridge is you can kind of think about it as a bot that 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 talks matrix on one side and speaks the other chat protocol on the other side. And it just sits there and it just sends your messages back and forth. So I'm on Beeper, which runs on matrix, and I can send a message to this bot. And then that bot will talk to Facebook or WhatsApp or 15 different networks. And that finally solved it for me. Like now I have everyone in one app. Yeah. And I mean, you're reaching into, you know, the, the standard kind of messaging uh, apps, let's say, but you're also kind of reaching into like DMs on Twitter and yeah. some of the kind of like integrations well, into social again, services. That's, that's that's kind of, I mean, when, that's, when you think about it, like Twitter is just, you know, exchanging short strings of yeah. text with each other, maybe some right. memes, some GIFs. Yeah, the, that's the thing that jumps out at me about it, because I often I often rant to my wife. I'm like, there are too many ways to get in touch with me. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like I, I have to keep track of Slack. I have to keep track of email. Yeah. I have to keep track of SMS. I have to keep track of Facebook Messenger, D, uh, Instagram Messenger, like all this sort of stuff. And and if you can just filter it all into one place and be able to because to, yeah. to your point, getting everyone onto the platform that you want to be on is Herculean an effort, you know, like, I, and I, I've been lucky enough to usher my, my, my side of the family to WhatsApp, but I've been unlucky on my in-laws who are all on, on iMessage and I'm an, obviously an Android user. And so I'm at a disadvantage there. Um, it's just a mess. And it's, it's like, Eric, it's this is something that we've been, we've been complaining uh, about for years. <laughs> Her, Herculean task. I would say Sisyphean, Sis, Sisyphean, yes, where, yeah, pushing that boulder because, up the because hill, every right? time. Because every time you get everyone onto a new chat network, like I convinced most of, you know, my friends and family to use WhatsApp, and then another one comes along, Signal, and now everyone's moving from WhatsApp to Signal, and so, I think yeah. it's a perennial problem. Like this will, like un unless you know something like Beeper comes along, it's just going to keep coming back to bite us. Yeah, a never-ending story. So then, mm -hmm. when you look at, or when I'm looking at the. Um, kind of the list, you know, of logos on your site. So it's beeperhq.com for people who want to uh, go there and, you know, sign up to kind of become part of this, uh, this experience and everything. Um, but when I look at the collection of icons and I, and I think about all of the messaging platforms that uh, it enables, 
you know, one thing that pops out to me that's a common, you know, discussion on this show is iMessage. And of course, mm -hmm. iMessage is tied mm -hmm. into this. And I would say, like, we've seen a lot of, we, you know, there, there have been plenty of examples over the years of integrated kind of like uh, chat, you know, all in one services, like, like we mentioned, like Adium and Trillion and all those. But when you start to throw iMessage into the mix, that's when people really pay even closer attention, right? And you guys are doing some really unique things as far as that's concerned uh, on Android. So talk a little bit about that because, I mean, is, was that the biggest challenge and how are you approaching that? Uh, so iMessage is one of those things that is very popular in the U.S., sort of popular in other countries, but like not not generally like a worldwide phenomenon. Um, it's also bifurcating, like it, it divides people rather than unites yes. them. So yeah, classism. I, I've been like casually interested in iMessage. I personally am not an iMessage user because obviously I have an Android phone and I have a Linux desktop and I have no, you know, great, great interest in iMessage, but I have heard from people that iMessage is something that <laughs> That's you should what they say. And so, <laughs> I guess like now I'm on iMessage, uh, but I still <laughs> am not like the biggest iMessage user even through Beeper. Um, so we looked at it and we said, well, obviously we have to support it because the whole thing about Beeper is you have to support all the networks. You can't just support some of them or else it's not a true universal chat app. And yeah. we really wanted it to be a universal chat app. Like, there's you've seen the XKCD comic, right? Where there's all the bubbles and different people yeah. on different network. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have it all. Like it's all gonna be there, uh, including I think one of the things on the the XKCD comic is like the comment section on Google Docs. You know, the one that you never check and like it's just like sitting there in the top corner. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have that. Like we're gonna have that at some point. Like you could do that on Beeper, sure. Uh, so iMessage obviously was one that we wanted to get. And we looked at all the different ways that you could reliably connect to iMessage. And obviously one is um, one, one option is running a client on a Mac OS uh, computer. And there's a bunch of apps that do this. Um, Air, Air Message is one of them. And it's great, you know, you get an app that talks iMessage. Um, so we knew that was possible. And we built, you know, uh, uh, a hook that allows people who do have a Mac to connect to iMessage and then relay that message to Beeper. But not everyone has a Mac. Like I have a Linux PC. Um, people have Android. Uh, we needed another option. And so after, you know, chasing down every lead possible, we came across this kind of like harebrained scheme, which is to jailbreak old iPhones run an app on that, which can read the uh, iMessage database on the jailbroken iPhone and write to it. So able to send messages as well. And then that app talks to our Beeper servers and routes it all the way back to your client. And it's all encrypted on the device, on the, um, on the iPhone. Our servers don't see any of your messages. We don't see any of the, the, the contents and voila you're on iMessage. All, right. All right, so there, there, there's a lot to unpack here. All right, so, so my first question is, what was that like to figure that out? Because I feel like that's either, that must have happened at like 2 a.m., after drinking no, a lot uh, of Jolt Cola or like, and I picture like a whiteboard and all this sort of stuff, like basically <laughs> what was the process that got you to that solution? I mean, we did Googling. so. <laughs> Technology is cyclical. Uh, someone did this 10 years ago. There's an app called Remote Messages. Uh, it's a jailbroken app, and you could run it on you know, iOS 5 or something like that, iOS 4, and it opens a web server that anyone on the local network could just, you know, you log onto your IP address slash, you know, iMessage, and it's like a web server served from your jailbroken iPhone. And that was, you were able to do it 10 years ago, so. Yeah, wow. I would love to say that we can take full credit for this, but really we, you know, know how to use Google and GitHub. All right, so so that's the how to do it, but then the the part of we take jailbreaking broken iPhones and ship them to users. How are you sourcing the phones? How is that a sustainable model? Mm -hmm. Why? There's there's a lot of iPhones. Ah. I mean, 
every every iPhone like people upgrade every year. There's there's an, there, it's a it's a renewable resource. <laughs> It's, it's sad but true on the on the upgrade pad. But I mean, I, I, I guess I guess suppose, I, I mean, I guess That's suppose you know, you, they always say with startups and things like that, you plan for wild success, right? And you know, yeah. ideally, you know, wild success for you is is shipping lots of jailbroken iPhones. Well, let's let's just say that like my success that I had expected was I I, pre I purchased fifty of them, thinking that you know maybe fifty people would yeah. want this, so. Yeah, <laughs> we got more than fifty signups. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm gonna, laughing. Yeah, well, that, that, that sorry, I'm laughing. Yeah. My, just like my, my last question is that can we can I be moved up on the wait list? I was talking to Tom Merritt, <laughs> our good friend from Daily Tech News Show. He asked if he could be moved up on the wait list. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a few. I, I tweeted the other day that I was like, I got a lot of chat messages the day after I launched. Uh, I'm sure you and did. It's a damn. Sure it's did. a damn good thing that I had Beeper because it would be crazy to have to balance what with that next day where the messages was. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, I, I mean, I, I just, I. As uh, Flo and Jason can attest, I really appreciate a bananas idea. And this definitely was like one of those things where like I got it sent to me by enough people who were like, you need to see this because it was just so it's so out of the box. So kudos to you for that. That's, happy, that's great. happy to provide. <laughs> so, Eric, I have to ask you kind of a hard question. You know, I OK, I've been on the Internet for a long time. And I was there with Trillion and Pigeon and I was there. Um, I recently did some reconfiguration to get AIM working on some wow. fan made servers, but that's a whole another conversation for another day. So I, I'm very invested in this idea of this like universal chat app and just sort of having something that I can easily log into and have everything available for me, I feel like productivity wise, this would be extremely helpful. But I also just feel like the noise of every day, having all of that chatting in one app would make it a little easier to deal with. But having said that, so having this idea back in the day, doing something like Trillion and Pigeon uh, was, I feel maybe a tad bit easier just because the internet wasn't so like, controlled <laughs> back then. And so I'm wondering what are some, maybe some challenges that you're taking into consideration getting this up and running? Um, I mean, are, you know, is there, is there any pushback that you've experienced from any of the companies? Um, that, cause a lot of these chat apps, they're not like free or open source or sort of community, uh, and ad led. Some of them have like tiers that you pay for. So I'm wondering, you know, including that, like, what are some challenges you guys are gearing up to, to confront? I mean, when you think about it at its core, these are your messages. These are your friends. These are your contacts. They're, you know, in some ways we like humans are social beings and we spend a lot of our time talking to each other. And in some ways, like you're building your memories through chat. I have, Phenomenal memories of like idling on MSN when I was in high school. I was I'm Canadian, so obviously I used MSN because all Canadians had MSN, and I had okay. ICQ. And I, you know that that uh oh is just uh -oh. seared in my memory. Uh -oh. And uh -oh. I, uh -oh. I, I just remember I, I had we had a bird growing up, and I swear that the bird figured oh, out no. a way of emulating <laughs> the uh oh. And so I would like I would race back to the computer just because I had to get there before my dad would open the message and, you know, right. see what I was talking about. And so find I had, out like, who it was you were talking to. Oh God, yeah. so, so such was, anxiety. Before, before encryption and before, you know, passwords and that kind of thing. So yeah, um, and I kind of wish that I had, I, I, okay, let me qualify that. I'm not sure that I want all of my ICQ logs, but it kind of would be fun to like occasionally go back and look at look at what, what was said and what was not said. I bet there would be like a lot of, hey, and then like an hour later, like, yo, that'd probably be a yeah. lot of my conversation. But it, it would be interesting to just have a copy of that. Yeah, and, I agree. I agree. And so why like why shouldn't you have access to your own messages if this is truly like your communication? Um, it's it's yours. So, I mean, it's a long way of saying. Take what's yours. Like these are mm. these are your messages. Um, you wrote them. Someone else wrote them back to you. 
they're not necessarily owned by some corporation. They're like your your messages. And the way to think about how we interact with them is every messaging app has an interface, whether it's a web interface, whether it's a Android app. Um, all we're doing is kind of pack, packaging that interface into another app. So when you open Beeper, you can think of it like in the back, in the back, there's like gears and cogs turning and they just connect to whatever network happened to have an app, a website, whatever. Kind of intercepts it along the way. And that, that actually, you know, ties right in with, with how it sounds like you're getting around the iMessage on Android uh, issue, yeah. right? The it's iPhone, just an iPhone or a Mac is running a server, essentially intercepting those messages and passing it through. That leads me to a question that I have about kind of like uh, protection, like privacy protection, security, uh, encryption, that sort of stuff. In doing so, does it, I mean, I'm assuming it lessens the security model of that particular messaging platform. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the thing to remember about iMessage is that the people think it's encrypted and it's kind of because yes, iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted, but by default, iCloud is enabled. And when you use iCloud, all your messages are backed up to Apple's servers and they hold the encryption keys. Sure. But however, at the same time, I mean, people feel, feel more comfortable uh, knowing that there is an encryption aspect yeah. and or so element the way to that. that the way that uh, Beeper works is we um, like we run a server like in this case on your on your Mac, um, but the server encrypts re-encrypts the messages with an encryption key that you set up, and then it sends it to the Beeper okay. servers, and oh, I see. we can't decrypt so the it's, messages. In fact, it's, so it's it's even better it's than more iMessage. It's, it's it's more <laughs> secure than iMessage. <laughs> Given that is no there, one has direct access to your server, which why would yeah, they? You could, say, turn, you, know, you could turn right. off iCloud backup yeah. when you use Beeper yeah. and have a record yeah. of all your messages without Apple being able to see it. So it's it's right. more secure. Hey. I do now, this with another obviously. open source app that I use, um, an app called Joplin. It does sort of the same kind of encryption where you have to set the the key across yeah. the different devices. Is that how it works here as well? That's exactly how it works. When okay. you set up a Beeper account, you have to uh, write down or copy into your password manager a string, and that string you need to keep safe because that's your that's your own personal authentication key. Uh, you never send that to the Beeper servers, but when you log into a new client, you have to load that key in. Or if you have already logged into one client, you can just copy a QR code um, from one of the screens. Could you self-host it? I know this is a very nuanced yeah. question, but it just the the app I was mentioning that one has you sort of set up a like Dropbox or some cloud service. So curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. um, we take security and privacy extremely seriously. Obviously, you know, uh, it's it's a messaging product. Like I just went on and on. Like this is you pouring your life out into chat. You don't want this to be public. I mean, considering people are now leaving WhatsApp because they just realize that Facebook owns it because uh, the whole encryption yeah. thing, I, I think, yeah, it's it's a definite talking point. <laughs> For sure. So so the way that we you know take this seriously is the connection point to each of these networks that, that we built um, is actually open source. You could go to our GitLab page today and look at it. Um, so you could look through the code that's running and you can run it yourself. That's the beauty of it. That's beauty of open source. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, or if you happen to have like a VPS server lying around, or you have you know one of those cheap Amazon or free Amazon um, AWS instances, you can run all the bridges on that and never like basically be ultra secure yourself. What uh, what happens if if uh, oops, sorry I just kicked my camera. What happens if the servers? go down as far as that's concerned what kind of protections there because i mean this is and i should also add i'm not sure if we've mentioned this this is this is a paid service so it's ten dollars correct me if i'm wrong ten dollars a month uh so you're paying for the service what exactly are you paying for and like what protections are happening at the back end so all your messages are encrypted before they hit our servers with your key so if you know our servers are compromised people can't read your messages um and you can store a backup of your messages as well. It's very easy to just download a copy of all your messages. Um, 
we made it a paid service because of a couple things. One is I think it really aligns the interests of our company with the interests of our users. Our mission is to build the best communication experience, period. And that means integrating with all the different ways that you already communicate, uh, which costs money. Like we had to you know, spend a lot of time to build all of those connections and to make them reliable and to make sure that they always work. And we wanted to make sure that the company was sustainable, that we didn't have to sell advertising against the content of your messages. We didn't have to, we don't have to sell, you know, your, your contact database to some advertising network. Um, this is, I think the best way that we could, uh, that we could do to, to align the interest between the users and the company. Hmm. I like, I like that idea of sort of having that paid tier to sort of help along. And so maybe my next question might be slightly moot, but I'm still curious, you know, are you, how are you guys going to make this easy for anybody to sort of use? Um, now I haven't used it, so I haven't had, I haven't had a chance to use the UI or really use the experience, but, uh, you know, back in the day using an integrated like universal messaging service would require that you, you had some familiarity you know, with downloading apps and configuring them. So how easy would this be for somebody who just wants to chat with their friend on iMessage? And that's, that's um, it. <laughs> so if you, if you have a Mac, it's as easy as downloading our app and turning it on because it just like automatically finds your iMessages on your Mac and it just works. So that's super easy. And then so if will you be don't have a Mac, yes, correct. There, there's quite a deal of onboarding. It does take, you know, five to 10 minutes to click through and set sure. up all the different apps. Um, we do support 15 different apps, so it, it takes a little while. Not everyone gets <laughs> yeah. all of them, but we have, I mean, we didn't purposefully gamify it, but there are like rings. And so if you want to close all the rings, you have to connect all the apps. And so right. I have seen some people just say like, oh, I might as well, might as well connect Skype, even though I rarely use Skype, like might as well connect it just, just for the fun of it. <laughs> All right. Um, well, this has been fascinating. It's awesome. And we do want to, though, it's great to have you on, Eric. And, and given your background and your history, um, uh, especially with Pebble, which is a product that we lauded and we loved, you know, you, you know, yeah. years ago on this very show, um, we wanted to ask you kind of how do you feel about the current state of wearables in the world? I know, you know, mm -hmm. Flow has been very critical of the wearable category um, and we've watched it kind of, you know, <laughs> explode on the scene and then kind of dip a little bit and fizzle and then kind of go, you know, and all this sort of stuff. So curious what, when you see well, the world of wearables, still, what do you think? You, you still know where my heart is here, you know? Oh, the, uh, okay. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Sweet. Are you like hacking it risk. to keep it like, you know, I mean, right. it does work with beeper. So, Oh uh, <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I would say that the the most amazing thing has been uh, I don't know if you followed along to the um, Rebel story. So a group mm -hmm. of Pebblers, uh, ex Pebble employees, and people in the third part in the third party developer ecosystem, they took it upon themselves after uh, we sold the company to rebuild uh, black box reinterpretation of the firmware, the mobile apps, and the app store and the web services, and they launched it three years ago. Uh, it's called Rebel, R E B B L E, um, and they have a paid service. I think it costs thirty dollars a month uh, a year, and they have thousands, if not tens of thousands, of subscribers of uh, people who love their Pebbles and want them to keep working. And I'm happy to say that uh, four years later, four years after we sold the company, um, the same watch is working. And the same iOS app works, the same Android app works, and uh, yeah. So if That's you really need a smartwatch, you know, you could still buy a Pebble on Amazon and enjoy a fantastic smartwatch experience. That's amazing. I love that the sure. the founder and CEO of Pebble, a company that uh, officially like dissipated three to four years ago, is using the community driven <laughs> stopgap measure to sure. keep Pebble going. That's awesome. I mean, I've tried all the other ones. I've tried the Samsung <laughs> watch. I've tried the Huawei watch. I've tried the Sony watches, Garmin. I've tried literally everything. But I mean, I was the one who designed Pebble. So I kind of built it with a very specific set of features and I have not been able sure. to find those features elsewhere. There you go. 
there you Fair go enough. right on and and you've and you've built this into beeper as well so anyone who's a, a big <laughs> fan and follower and, and paid subscriber of rebel hey here you go uh yeah. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna find some functionality in there as well Amazing stuff. Eric, um, really appreciate you uh, carving out some time uh, tonight to join us to talk about Beeper. Uh, it was cool watching that story kind of blow up and, and follow it. And, you know, it, it really does speak to a, a longstanding uh, issue with Android around messaging. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it uh, and to see kind of how, you know, how it addresses the multi-chat universe problem on android and and beyond android of course um and especially kind of play around with imessage i'm not an ios user so i don't have any sort of history with imessage but we talk about it a whole lot so i feel like i need to put my money where my mouth is as far as that's concerned give so. it a shot i'm excited to hear what you guys think i can't yeah, wait right i on. will gladly take my money sir i will gladly i mean i don't even need the iphone i've got i've got a, i've got a mac I here i just want to stop but, yeah, being so. a green bubble i just don't yeah, want to be too. a green bubble yeah. in people's lives anymore <laughs> Yeah. The green bubble of shame. <laughs> yeah. Well, well Eric uh, Mijikowski, uh, creator of Beeper, beeperhq.com. Uh, anything else you want to point people to uh, right now? No, that's it. Enjoy that's it. it. And uh, right thanks on. for having me on. Absolutely, Eric. It's our pleasure. And uh, best of luck uh, with Beeper as you enter this next phase of, oh, holy cow, what is this thing? Everybody's checking it out. And we are really happy for you guys to have this sudden um, sudden burst of attention. So congratulations, Eric. And uh, we'll be following. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. All right. Uh, awesome stuff. Great to talk with. I mean, you know, honestly, Eric is behind a piece of mobile history, right? Huge, Pebble, yeah. Pebble is, mm -hmm. Pebble I mean, is a, about, huge, I mean, it's a like, chapter. Wearables don't exist yeah. without, uh, you know, without Pebble and, and what it was yeah. at the time. Uh, so tons of respect to Eric. And I love that this has been a multi-year endeavor for him and it blew up the internet when it got announced. Um yeah, yeah, no, I think I, I couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I think he's awesome. I'm glad we had him on the show. That was very cool. So <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, let's uh, let's take a break and then we're going to get into some other news happening in the Android world. Uh, but first, want to welcome a new sponsor to the show. That's Udacity. I'm very familiar with Udacity, and we you, actually we've talked about Udacity on the show, uh, was particularly when Gina Trapani was a co-host on the show. You remember way back when. Uh, Udacity was in the news uh, because Google was working with Udacity and uh, bringing their nano degree program uh, to light. And Gina was, you know, big time. Uh, she she jumped right into the nano degree, totally loved it. So we've talked about them a lot on the show. So it's great to have Udacity along. Uh, there are a ton of tech jobs out there. Um, and you want to know, obviously, you know, whether you actually qualify enough to apply and Udacity is all about educating you so that you are, you don't want to waste your valuable time and your money, uh, you know, applying for jobs that you don't actually qualify for. Allow yourself to get qualified uh, using Udacity. It's the world's fastest, most efficient way uh, to actually master all of those skills that tech companies are looking for. And like I said, nano degrees are a great way to do that. Udacity Nano Degree Program is a very unique online educational offering. It's really just designed to get uh, to bridge the gap between learning and whatever your career goals may be. So you can uh, dive in, learn a suite of employable skills, and they actually partner with industry leaders and experts who really understand the in-demand skills uh, that are applicable to the job market right now. So you get a ton of knowledge. Uh, once you enroll as a student, uh, you pick a specific course offering. You'll be prompted to view the online course as well as, uh, you know, complete a series of projects. So it's not just watching videos. It's really completing projects. It's a curriculum uh, and support courses designed to help you develop job relevant skills. Udacity helps you build a profile, which is incredibly important to have a profile listed on GitHub uh, and LinkedIn. 
that way you can show prospective employers uh, what you know, and you can learn to network, get noticed, land the job that you want, ultimately. Services related to the nano degree program uh, may include classroom mentorship, moderated forums, project reviews uh, for a personalized experience. You can build skills through industry-leading programs that are built and recognized by top companies worldwide. You know, IBM, Microsoft, Google, like I said, AWS, people from all over the world are actually using Udacity now. 13 million registered users in more than 160 countries with more than 1.3 million projects completed and passed. And there have been 150,000 uh, nano degree certificates earned as well. They have some just really great programs for you to choose from uh, that really fit the tech niche that you're looking for, all sorts of them, AI, cloud computing, data science, autonomous systems uh, programming, uh, development, product management, <laughs> digital marketing, uh, all kinds of roles that you can educate yourself around, tech adjacent roles as well uh, at Udacity uh, that prepare you for so many more uh, possibilities. And you can improve your earning potential and take charge of your career. With Udacity, you get real employable skills through project-based active learning uh, that really covers cutting-edge technology. So projects, you know, they're reviewed by those qualified professionals that I talked about, uh, and you're going to have a real human uh, help you and personalize uh, the experience with code reviews. Uh, you'll get access to qualified mentors 24-7. Pretty awesome stuff. And if you want to, you know, just like test it out, kind of dip your toe in and check it out for yourself, you can do that. Udacity has free courses. They offer flexible payment options as well. So you can learn at your own pace and your own schedule. Uh, and then, you know, you go to the site, you're going to find some testimonials, of course. Take Francisco Gutierrez. He wanted a better life. Uh, but, you know, a four-year degree was just too expensive, and the programming classes that he found at the community college never really translated into job-ready skills. So he participated in the Grow with Google Udacity Challenge. He was awarded a full scholarship for the Mobile Web Specialist Nano Degree, which is pretty awesome. The Nano Degree took him step-by-step, step and he received an internship from Microsoft who offered him a full-time role as a software engineer. How about that? All possible because of Udacity. And by the way, technology, it's disrupting enterprises across every industry as well. So check out Udacity for Enterprise and upskill your entire workforce. Get the education that broadens your horizons. You can visit udacity.com slash twit today and you'll get 50% off through May 30th, 2021. And you can redeem this offer by using coupon code TWIT. Make sure and do that. And the discount will be applied at checkout. That's udacity.com slash TWIT, coupon code TWIT. And Udacity, thank you so much for your sponsorship and, and uh, supporting TWIT and All About Android. It's great to have you along. What a great program that you have going on there. All right. And with that, it's time for some news. <laughs> Yeah, hardware works too. Hardware news. Hardware news. No. Kind of all is, isn't it? <laughs> no, not really. Wait a second. There's no news section. There's no, no news. yeah. Burke was Burke was going Burke did, based Burke on what the was right on the cue. dock. He did the right cue. <laughs> it's a, it's okay. I had, yeah, the, there there was uh, there was shenanigans going on the dock. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's just play it on a loop. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, all about Android, chill wave. It's about time. We got a lo-fi beat. Chill wave edition. That's right. Yeah. So, okay. So I realize this top story isn't really Android, but I kind of tie it into Android when I think about it. So what happened? Well, uh, Google um, announced, I think they announced today, in fact, that their VR app, Tilt Brush, is uh, not going to get any more development. They're ceasing development of the app. Uh, they also announced that they're open sourcing it for the VR community, which is actually pretty oh, wait, awesome. That's good. That's good. That's good. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's cool. That just means the community can take the code. You know, Google even said, you know, we want everyone to learn how we built the project. And they say, you know, encouraging the community to take it in directions that are near and dear to them. And I mean, people are very passionate about Tilt Brush and what it offers. For those of you who don't know, it's a VR app. It's really like a For drawing. For those of you who don't like know, <laughs> you need a VR headset. It's very oh. expensive. Only the richest people can use it. <laughs> just kidding. I'm sorry. I don't know why don't, I did that. You know what? It's just something about virtual reality one. that. Yeah, it's it's a little exclusive, I suppose. It's no, I'm sorry. I did that. I, <laughs> I just got tilt brush like a month ago. So for me, it's yeah. like I've been waiting all this time. And now they're like, yeah, see what you want to do with it. Yeah, it's not going anywhere <laughs> though. You can still play it. In fact, they're not even removing it from from the the true, stores, true. you know, from the different VR uh, stores. So you can I mean, still. All it is get is a it. painting app. It's you paint yeah. in three D. You you yeah. can draw yourself little characters and you know draw draw yourself the car Jeez. that you'll never afford and the the plants that you'll never keep alive and all of those things. Yeah. Um, you're you're painting a, a very bleak picture here. It's a virtual reality, brush. Jason. I want people to know that they can create their own realities. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's true. <laughs> we might be living in a virtual reality, so that's virtual reality For within the virtual reality. So yeah, this could that's be virtually a possible. For all yeah, we know yeah, this is yeah. the Matrix too. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the reason that I even brought this up was uh, it just seems like yet another prong in the uh, Google decides it really doesn't like VR anymore uh, thing. Uh, you know, they shuttered Daydream. They just recently got rid of Poly, which is a 3D model uh, sharing site. Mm. Now they're getting out of Tilt Brush, which Tilt Brush, I mean, when it launched, it was a big deal. Like it was it like, was. whoa, that's that's really cool. Every It was like Wasn't it Vive one of the, only originally. What's that? Wasn't it on the Vive only? Oh, I can't remember. That that sounds right. Like what platforms were there at that point? There was Oculus and there was Vive. And I think you're right. Yeah. I think it was like Vive initially. Yeah. And um, then it was a big deal when it came to Oculus because it finally became a little more because Vive is just not it's not every person available. It's not accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Burke, Burke is confirming Vive only. So good memory on that. Um so anyways, just another step in Google saying, you know what, we don't really actually want to do VR anymore. We're going to go ahead and tiptoe out. Well, what room. do you expect? They're not doing the Daydream headset anymore. The remote has been integrated into the TV lineup. It, I just don't really, yeah. there's just, that's it. This is it. Yeah. They're giving it to the community, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, but totally. But I think this speaks very loudly about what Google's intentions are in the virtual reality sphere. So, <laughs> well, I, no, lack I, of I, intention. I think it, I think it nails the, it's the nail in the coffin to what we've already heard in terms of yeah. Google's involvement in the virtual reality. I think that Absolutely. virtual reality was a bet a couple of years ago that has not panned out. And I think that Facebook has got the most exposure with the, with the Oculus acquisition, um, exactly. followed by Sony, followed by Sony and Google played it safe. They did, they dipped their toe in the water and they got out. So. Yeah. Yep. They got out. They went running for the virtual door. I mean, is that uh, it, guys? Again, Does that mean wh why did we try to make phones? Why did we try to make fetch happen? Why did we try to make virtual reality <laughs> happen on a phone? It was the stopgap I mean, measure. It, it was, yeah. uh, look, your phone can do everything. It can even do VR. And all it takes is this little cardboard contraption. No. You which, know, by the way, if 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 which, you if we need to look back on the history of VR, yeah. that cardboard contraption probably did yep. more for Google in the space yes. than Daydream ever did. It, nor it normalized yeah. oh, it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Ron, totally. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. They're still using this Absolutely. stuff in the Google Classrooms, I imagine. This is something that could get, you know, gosh, it'd be really cool if there was like a a small education it's startup could like take the open source, you know, Tilt Brush, maybe like whatever was, came out with Project Tango, for instance, uh, and just like meld that together into something educational. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, they they ended expeditions as well. They're like entirely out of VR at this Dang. point. I don't know what else they have going yeah. in VR. So no so more going to Mars, to huh? No more going to virtual Mars. Nope. It wasn't virtual. No, 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 no. 
it, it, it was virtual for us, but the photos were all strung together from actual satellite imagery of, from the Mars rover, which made it very cool. Because then it made you real, re- realize what a small speck you are in this giant, vast universe. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. <laughs> really that is deep true. today. Um, you are. Yeah. Should we go to the next what, news item? Yeah. What kind of deepness can you bring to Android 12? Uh, oh my gosh. See, it's funny you say that because in my notes I wrote, <clears throat> further proof that life goes on despite the disasters raining down around us, we still have things to look forward to in Android 12. <laughs> right. at least i'm sorry least I'm, I'm in it um so now remember in that early dev preview of android 11 i know it was so long ago there was actually a double tap gesture on the back of the phone so you would double tap on the back of the phone to do something well we didn't this. make it in i'm sorry i remember this i remember we were discussing yes. this yeah um, now, it didn't make it into Android 11, but it is coming back for Android 12, at least on Pixel devices. So now it's codenamed Columbus, sadly not codenamed Columbo, which I think it should be. Mm, that would have been better, yeah. There's always that that one more thing. But anyway, this uh, apparent double tap on the backside will do any of the following actions. Activate the Google Assistant, akin to when we were squeezing our phones. <laughs> Take a screenshot, pause, resume media playback, open the notification shade, and open the recent apps view. So just kind of some of those those gestures, those actions we were doing with the squeeze gesture. Looks like it's coming to the back of the phone, which, right. quite frankly, makes a little more sense. Yeah, makes a more I like sense. that. I think it's a, a neat feature. Uh, I wonder why um, they held it off. I wonder why it didn't, because it really did seem like it was there, and then suddenly it wasn't. It's always curious. To, I'm always curious about that. Like you, you were so close. Technological. It happened in the boardroom decision. You know what I mean? Somebody said, "Gads, I got this to work." <laughs> or or <laughs> maybe it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or maybe it was just like it's the year 2020. Nothing is what it seems. Let's just not do it. Yeah, it could be something like that. Yes. What um, else in Android I, 12? Yeah, I do also want to add the little fact that there is a complete redesign of the split screen system also slated to come in Android 12. Now, this would include the ability to match up app pairs. Um, and I believe I when I did the review of the LG phones this last year, 2020, that there was a similar feature on those phones that it sounds is coming natively to Android 12. So that's kind of nice. Just the ability to mm-hmm. launch two apps at the same time um, as you need them. Maybe yeah. more integration for those flipping phones as well. Yeah. That, that, uh, that functionality is on the note 12 ultra or what I'm, I'm losing track of the, what is the last note? Is it the note 20 or the note 12? I don't even know. I don't remember point. Jason. I just call them <laughs> note 21. I just seen 21 and just, Bundle them all together. Just pick one. The numbers are getting to me. Anyways, the latest note uh, has app pairs as well, and it's useful. I like it. Nice well, feature. now it's going to come natively to Android, so other other phones will be able to use it as well. And then lastly, just this one last little tidbit from Android 12, which is not here yet, but it's coming, supposedly. A nearby share will allow for easy is that password, Jason, that you meant to write in the notes? It says wireless Wi-Fi. password. Oh, yeah, Wi-Fi okay. Password. Wire, yeah. Wi-Fi yeah. password. I'm sorry I called you out, by the way, on the air. I yeah, didn't okay. need to have that be negative. But wireless password. So Wi-Fi password sharing between devices. And this is kind of um, taking off the emphasis on the QR code sharing method, which if you've been using the share functionality in Android 11, you'll notice that it usually comes up first now. I noticed it recently. It's just always scan a QR code, scan a QR code. So I guess we're back to that. The QR code will never die. Nope. You know, we'd we'd still be rocking the QR code if we had the arena. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I, it's, it's you know, still alive I gotta be in my honest heart. With you, I completely forgot that we had those in our arena. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, you did. And we had I'm a lot of people that were like. I, I tuned them out. Used I used it. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Hey, actually, well, that's- QR codes, I might add, actually come in handy if you're setting up uh, a, a smart home. A lot of smart home devices no, have agree. a little tiny QR code. 
and that's how you match to it. I so used I used the I, I just set up the new Chromecast on on my Frame TV, yep. and I used the I used the QR code uh, to link it to the Home app. Yeah, that worked. Yep. So and QR codes have come a long way. We implemented it in, yeah. on Scorbit on the Scorbit app to, as a way to as That's a way great. to share as a way to share pinball games and and stuff like that. We made it so that if you own a machine, you can print out a QR code and put it on the machine, and then just scan the QR code, and it just takes you right to that game in the app. Um, and we did QR codes also to share, like to, to. I mean, QR codes actually aren't that bad. I'll I'll go. I'll, this is I will my say bias. That. Okay, this yep. is my bias that I have to contend yep. with. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> I just realized real quick before you uh, you tear into your story, Ron, uh, we had decided that this week we were going to check in on your TV. Uh, I know, but, but, I, but didn't, the, I didn't but factor the, that in here. It's okay. The, the, the interview stuff was kinda... way was way more interesting. So next week we'll do the TV check in. So <laughs> okay, next week. But All I right, will I will give a tease that uh, I am very happy. So oh, that's nice. good. That's good. All right. Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right, but in the meantime, I'm also very happy with uh, much clearer search results on mobile. Thank you, Google. Um, Google announced a big redesign on search results on mobile devices. Uh, this is mainly a visual redesign with a focus on simplicity. Uh, the old search had a lot of extra crap around it, um, which you, as you see this redesign, you go, oh, yeah, actually, these search results on mobile weren't that great. Um, so the, the results now go edge to edge. You have larger text as well, and they, uh, they're they leveraging color to emphasize important aspects of results. Um, and it's basically they're just, uh, you know, moving elements around and lightening up the load to make it easier to see and understand, of which I applaud the effort, Google, because um, I have yeah. noticed – I have noticed my mobile experience on Chrome mm -hmm. on Android has been much simpler and more delightful to use. So I do like when you think of you know one of the one I think one of the most under underscored or undervalued things that have been happening in the Android world has been the uh, evolution of design of visual design uh, across all of their apps, across all of the way mobile inter interacts with Google's products and services, down to the font, down to the rounded corners, things like that. You're seeing unification across the look, whether it's Google News or search results or things like that. Um, and I, I, for one, am pleased uh, as punch for it. So thank you, Google. Have you? Did you guys yeah. notice this at all, or I yeah, haven't noticed I, it? I, no, I, I haven't noticed it. The font is smaller on Google Chrome now. I tip. I typically use DuckDuckGo for my web browsing, but sometimes I have. I actually use Chrome as sort of like a like a siloed web app of sorts on my device. So I'll have like my Target and my Amazon because I don't want those apps on my phone, but I want sort of that. You know, I want the autofill and I want the ease of use and all that. And so I've noticed that the font has gotten just a tiny bit smaller in some of those web apps. So, yep. or maybe my vision's going, you know, I'm, I'm aging. <laughs> Could be both. Could be. Could be Could both. both. Could be both. Okay, call yeah. me. Call me. Yep. Yep. Yes. And, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I welcome it. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll be looking for it. And I appreciate that. So, uh, all right. And then up next, yes, it is finally time for some hardware news. Well, let's do it, Burke. Good. Oh, I just realized what happened. Uh-oh. What? I just realized why we did that bumper again. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, Third time's a charm. <laughs> Hardware <laughs> news bumper. Uh, we love you, Burke. Uh, this this actually hardware block is interesting because it's a, there's kind of like a, a theme running throughout it. It's it's very yeah. phone business oriented. But you got yeah. the first one, Flo. Well, I mean, it speaks to the current landscape, and I think it's great that we're kind of covering this in the chunk. First, we're going to start with LG. This news kind of came in late last week, which it looks like LG might be done building phones, and if not now, mm. at least very soon, at, and at least if not completely not building phones, not at the amount that it did this last year. So Say LG it ain't CEO, so. Say it ain't sorry? so, Flo. Say yeah, it ain't I know, so. Right? Well, okay, let's. So LG CEO Quan Bongsyuk 
told employees the company might get out of the phone biz in a memo reported on by the Korea Herald. Now, LG confirmed the legitimacy of this news item, but it noted that nothing had been decided yet. So that's why we're sort of like, don't know exactly to which extent um, from some of the other sort of pieces of news that I've read in the last week, there's rumblings that LG might focus just on these, like doing one fun, high-powered device versus, uh, excuse me, in addition to outsourcing their uh, low-end devices. But Mm -hmm. again, that's all here saying it looks like if nothing has been decided yet by LG itself, if there's no press release from them, then it's not, in my mind, it's not truly confirmed yet. But it does speak to how 2020, you know, when we looked back at all those the year behind us, you know, a lot of people wrote Mm -hmm. personal blogs, myself included, just about how we learned the holes in the midst of all this disaster. Well, I say the same could be said for the smartphone industry, which is that there was so much saturation of phones and brands that it made sense in the midst of so much disaster happening. Companies decide, oh, crap, we're really not making money in that division. We can't do that anymore. So, right. LG, and LG is not a top five phone maker anymore. You know, that was what, seven years ago that they were really doing that. And now they've been superseded by so many other brands, um, some of which, Ron, you're about to tell us about. Yes. So, well, that was a, I mean, that was a great, I wasn't prepared for that throw Sorry. because I, because I wanted to <laughs> lament, lament losing LG's wacky phones, uh, that mainly came out of their R and D, which is a great segue to this next story because, um, uh, over on the R and D front and R and D stands for research and development. Um, it looks as if, uh, one plus an oppo are merging their research and development efforts. We all know that OnePlus and Oppo have been curiously uh, cousin companies, connected, uh, yeah. you know, connected under the BBK electronics umbrella. I remember when OnePlus came out, we were very confused as to whether or not they were actually Oppo or Oppo was funding them or whatnot, but they've always been somewhat connected in that way. But effectively, this took place in December 2020, um, and this is similar to how Xiaomi and Redmi share their their research and development systems. Um, Oxygen OS and Color OS are still going to remain separate, um, and the devices are going to stay differentiated as well for now but who knows in the long term. Um, And many of their devices look similar to each other already um, because they look somewhat related. For example, the OnePlus 8 Pro and the Oppo Find X2 Pro are nearly identical from a spec standpoint. Um, So maybe whatever gap LG leaves in the research and development space, Oppo and OnePlus uh, can fill and come up with wacky phones that fold and roll and or wings and all that sort of stuff. I don't think so, though. I don't see that coming from OnePlus or Oppo. I think we'll still have that from LG, at least. I mean, come on. They put out so many interesting phones last year. I don't know. I don't know. Jason, what's Honor doing? (laughs) Honor? Honor? Are you talking about Honor? Honor. 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 Well, um, God, I don't remember if last year we actually talked about Honor being sold off by Huawei. We we probably did. We probably we mentioned did. It at we some mentioned point, it, but. but we haven't really covered the phones in a while because the last yeah. U.S. launch they had here was the Honor Eight, which was years ago, six years ago. Yeah, yeah. I don't really see which which was uh, which was kind of a shame because man, I I got an Honor device that was early a nice phone. on. And it was a really nice phone. It's broken at this point. The glass shattered on it. But it was really nice before it was shattered. It was totally my Mm. fault. I can't Mm. remember how I did it, but uh, you can blame me for that. Anyways, uh, Honor has announced its new V40 5G device, which is its first device since it was sold off, since the company was sold off by Huawei last November. Basically, uh, Huawei sold off Honor because... You know, they, they cited tremendous pressure, which you can imagine, obviously, uh, directly related to this restricted supply chain around the U.S. Uh, sanctions that were applied to it. Honor was independently operated by Huawei, but was still affected by those supply chain issues. So uh, Huawei ended up selling off Honor. This is their first device since that 
uh, sell-off. Um, they're going to release it first to China, but they have the plan to eventually release it uh, worldwide as The View. And uh, when it happens, we're guessing that there's going to be Google services on this and that's obviously thanks to the sell-off. So that would be <laughs> a great a great bonus to have on a device like this. But uh, just a real quick uh, rattling off of specs, 6.72-inch OLED, 120 hertz display. There's a MediaTek Dimensity 1000 Plus processor, a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, 66 watt fast charge, pretty fast charge there, 50 watt wireless fast charge, and then a 50 megapixel camera sensor but i personally i'm just i'm curious to get my hands on a current honor device and see how how they are doing uh now just compared to the device that i had that i can't even remember which device it was uh however many years ago yes but also just kind of compared to what we're used to seeing right now and you know after the sell-off is Honor a brand, like, does Honor have more capability of excelling and of thriving now um, as a brand in other parts, not just China, but in other parts of the world? So, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of like, movement in the phone space. LG getting out, OnePlus and Oppo combining efforts more than they already were, which already kind of seemed like in some ways they were, whether they wanted to admit it or not. Uh, Huawei selling Honor and Honor doing its own thing. Like you said, Flo, a lot of kind of consolidation of the market. And I don't know, in general, that's not necessarily always a good thing, right? When things consolidate, less choice. Maybe Android isn't hurting for choice, though. I don't know. You know, all this honor talk has me thinking about we really have not had Mateo on the show in a long time in person. He used to bring us all of these phones from overseas. He'd rescue them, find them homes and bring them to us. To the point where I can I cannot I cannot even discuss the manufacturer honor without hearing it with his accent. Yes, uh, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, with that, that extra H. It. Yeah. Honor, yeah, I can't even do it, but in my head, that's what I hear. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, he really does take care of his honor devices. He gives them a nice uh, mocodile coat uh, to keep them warm could, and protected. Could you say that he? he could helps you say them that he travel? Could you, you know, say that he, he makes them he, warm? He, he honors his honor devices. He he honors them hard. Yeah, honors totally. them. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, he can feel his ears burning right now. Uh, even when you're not on, you're on, Mateo. How do you do that? It's so weird. All right. Let's uh, – oh, I'm looking forward to this. Up next, we're going to get to a few of your rugged emails. And boy, let me just say, we got a gonna... lot of emails this week. Way too many for us to obviously put into the show. Um, definitely more than we normally get. I'd say about half of them were rugged stories. So I'm sorry, not all of them get in today. We've got four emails. I chose a few. Uh, Ron, you've got the first one. I, I got to say, I've been waiting all week for this. I love this. The fact that we put out the call for you rugged phone users and you answered um, yes. is just fantastic. So almost almost so much so, Jason, that I feel like we should, we should read every email we get over the next future few shows just to get everybody in there. Um, <laughs> just to get them all in there. <laughs> just to get them all in. Uh, but all right, so our first one comes from Tim, who writes in from Waterloo, Ontario, up north in Canada, our neighbors to the north. Uh, and Tim says, in response to Ron's call for rugged Android phones, I'm sending a few pictures of this Sonom phone, S-O-N-I-M. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of a Sonom phone. This is fantastic. He says, it was, used fa it was used Whoa. faithfully for many years by someone responsible for the cleaning of transport trucks and with a history of breaking phones. The employee moved on and I retired the phone, but it did see a lot of use and held up nicely. If I remember correctly, it had a five-year, no questions asked warranty on any sort of damage and we used to throw it across the room into walls just for the shock look on people's faces when we did it it's running android 5.1.1 lollipop <laughs> and likely will never get an update the entire time we owned it 
so the Sonom phone running Android Lollipop, and that is a rugged phone, Tim. Look at look at the. Uh, what I like about this one is that the ruggedness is worked into the buttons at the bottom. Like there, there's right. actual physical a physical home button and a physical back button, uh, and it's all worked in there. And you've got the little antenna nodule in the upper right. Um, Sonom. It looks like a cool phone. Yeah. That looks rugged. So I give that. I give that a. I give that a seven. A seven on the rugged Android scale. Hold on. It I, might go up. It might go up for you when I tell you that this phone can be wiped down with bleach and it will not disintegrate. Oh, so, I, I've got to give. Yeah. So that that's going to knock this up to a fourteen then. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So yeah, the bleach. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. SonomTech.com. So the great thing about the rugged Android phone scale is that you don't know what the numbers mean. Only I do. So that gets a 14. <laughs> okay. 14. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Sonim, S O N I M. That's a that's a brand I've never heard of before. But it exists. Wow. It's a security hazard, but you can dunk it in bleach. <laughs> it's amazing. All right, Flo, you got the next one. All right. Uh, I do apologize for my video for anybody watching. It's been one of those nights. So Derek wrote in, I myself am not a Kyocera, Kyocera rugged phone user, but my brother-in-law is, or should I say was. He had the previous model of Kyocera rugged phone because he's an outdoorsman and is very rough with his phones as well at his work skiing maintenance at a power plant. He bought the Kyocera because of the claimed Sapphire screen. He was shocked when a month into owning it, he had shattered the screen and could not get it replaced. Oh. Needless to say, he has no interest in getting another Kyocera phone and is now using a Samsung phone in an OtterBox. Thanks for writing in, Derek. And, well, at least you don't have to worry about your brother not having security updates. Yep. Yeah, that's true. It's a good point. I don't know how Kyocera devices do as far as security updates are concerned, but Samsung probably a little better. I can tell you how they do on the rugged Android phone ranking. They get a two point five. Oof! Wow. Ouch. Well, okay. I mean, I mean, if the, if he shattered, if he shattered the screen, that's a problem. Yeah, sapphire it's screen not very rugged. shattered. Not one month. Not rugged. Yeah, not rugged. Not good. Mm. Not good, Bob. Uh, Mike writes in to say, I spent 30 years in the army. As far as rugged phones, I have always used a rugged case with a Samsung phone. Wait My preferred a second. case is. Is this the email what? of the week? No. no, the next the next one this is. This is not. Whoa. This is not the email of the week. Whoops. This is before the email of the week. It's okay. Oh, burr. Uh, we, we did four emails today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, wait, I'll said, just tell you. I only have three three of the graphics, so that's we're okay. going to play we'll it by ear. The fourth okay. one. It's all so good. So pretend I, so restart, I'm going to mute again. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. We got an email from Mike who says, I spent 30 years in the army. As far as rugged phones, I have always used a rugged case with a Samsung phone. My preferred case is hands down the OtterBox Defender. So here's OtterBox again. And observing my fellow soldiers, I would say rugged cases are the norm and not rugged phones. Basically, all I ever needed was water, dust, and drop protection. I spent a year in Afghanistan and my phone made it through with an OtterBox Defender case. I think as the IP rate Rating improved on phones, especially in the area of water protection, the need for actual rugged decreased. However, there is one specific instance where I did purchase a rugged phone. Several years ago, I purchased the Kyocera DuraForce for my son, who was a freshman in high school. The reason for going with the DuraForce was that he was hard, in, in, uh, in uh, quotes, on phones and did not like using cases. The DuraForce was usually, was actually a great phone, perfect for him. Literally, he could toss the DuraForce in his backpack and not worry about any damage. Uh, signed Mike. So awesome uh, insight. As a kid in high school, are you happy when your parent gives you a rugged phone and sure. not an iPhone? Yes, because you you are set apart from the pack. You have been identified <laughs> as somebody who needs a little more extra ruggedness to your phone. I, I don't know. I, I, I think I think you're the envy of the entire class at that point. Everybody has an iPhone. Right. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like I get the, I get the argument Mike's making here about uh, a Samsung phone or an iPhone in an otter box and like how an otter box case can can turn any a regular phone into a rugged phone. It's still not a rugged phone. Sorry. It's still just a yeah. regular phone with a fancy shell True. around it. 
So true. Um, but I Anyone will say Dura- could put an otter box in their phone. Exactly. And make it a, Dura- uh, come on. Uh, but I will say the Kyocera Duraforce gets a 9.6 on the uh, rating scale. So good job. Okay. Mike. So it's nice so. to know that your rating scale isn't uh, by manufacturer. It's by model. No, it's by the individual phone. Oh yeah. No, it's an, indi- okay. this is why it's so hard because we have to review every phone and give it its rating. It's not, you know, not manufacturer or even line. Someone else could have yeah. a Duraforce that would have a much higher or lower rating. The rugged, it's a whole completely different algorithm. So um, yeah. which which leads us to our email of the week. Uh, our email of the week comes from Chief W O two. I don't think that's what your given name was, but uh, Chief W02 says, I used a Kira phone when I was a signal officer in the army. I loved it. Each time we went out into the field or deployment, I take the rugged smartphone with me instead of my iPhone. We got to talking about it one day and I demonstrated its toughness by repeatedly throwing out, throwing it out across gravel roads, stomping on it and skipping it across the tarmac. It always worked very durable. And I would like to note here that Chief WO2 does not mention where or what he was doing in the field during these deployments. And given what's been going on in the world, I can only imagine that that phone has got a lot of miles on it. It's probably seen a lot of stuff. It's probably been in a lot of stuff. And Chief WO2, as well as uh, Mike, we thank you for your service. Uh, and Chief Chief WO2, I'm going to give your Kyocera phone a 17 on the rugged rating because it survived tarmac. So good job. Yeah, skipping across the tarmac, that's no small feat. No small feat. No small feat. Stomping on it, that's no small feat. Nope. Uh, let's see. Feet. Burke. Stop. There you go. Never mind. <laughs> uh, awesome stuff, Chief. Is that your first name? I'm not really quite sure. But thanks so. for being the email of the week. Email of the week. Okay. All right. It's great. It's not By the way, that. please, please. Okay, so so I need to adjust. Please keep the stories of rugged phones coming purely just to make Jason's job that much harder. Um, but <laughs> uh, I will give you any – we need photos. We want to see these phones. Oh, yeah. So if you've got photos yeah. of your phones, please send them along as well. So thank you. Yeah, and it – and if they've been uh, if they've been abused, even though they're rugged phones and they show sign of wear and tear, even better. We want to see that it still survived. Agreed. We want to see that it survived the the tarmac. Triple A at twit.tv is where you can send those, and we do appreciate it. All right, we have reached the end of this episode of All About Android. Want to thank once again our guest from earlier in the show, Eric Mijakowski from Beeper, uh, beeperhq.com. If you want to check that out. And then flow always. I always enjoy doing a podcast with you. Thank you so much for hopping on tonight. What you want to plug? I have, you know, you can just follow me on the internet, florencelion.com. I'm on social media channels. Oh, that flow. Um, if you want to watch me socialize my Tamagotchi, I've been doing that on TikTok. You know, I'm just trying to find ways to pass the time until I get a vaccine in my arm. So. Until then, I'm just at home playing with my toys on the internet. Okay. Aren't we all? Indeed. Oh, that flow uh, on Twitter, FlorenceIon.com online. Ron, what about you? Uh, I did not plan uh, my time to promote myself very well because my two other side things both released things recently, so bear with oh. me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at RonXO. Um, still posted pictures of Christmas trees on Instagram, so enjoy that. Uh, but over at iFanboy, me and my buddies, uh, Connor and Josh, put out our latest Media Explode, our monthly uh, podcast about what uh, TV and movies we're watching, and we went we did a deep dive on Mandalorian Season 2. So if you're curious what me and the other iFanboy guys thought of The Mandalorian. Uh, go listen to that over at iFanboy.com and over at Scorbit on the on the pinball side of the world uh, we just re- we did our first app release of 2021 and it was a big one. Um, we, we rolled out a bunch of new features and a bunch of new stuff including QR codes. Um, very cool stuff. So if you're curious about pinball or just want to see what I've been working on go to the Google Play Store, search for Scorbit, S-C-O-R-B-I-T download the app Check it out. Uh, Appreciate all your support. 
Thanks, everybody. Right on. Good work, Ron. Uh, big Thank thanks you. to Burke for playing, uh, for pushing the buttons and playing cues when we when we say certain words. I'm not going to say it again. You don't need to play it. We played it many times today. Uh, but thank you, nonetheless. Also, thanks to... <laughs> yeah, that one doesn't get nearly enough play, to be honest. <laughs> uh, thanks also to Victor behind the scenes uh, bringing this show to you once we're done. I really couldn't do it without you either, Victor. Um, as far as for me, at Jason Howell on Twitter. And if you want to check out my my nerditude, if you want to see me like like basically transform myself into... Uh, fifth to seventh grader me, then Aww. check out Hands on Tech. I did a review of the C64, which is my Commodore Thank 64 you, emulator that I that I adore. And uh, I'll, I'll be Jason. honest, it totally, it totally takes me back. Like I'm still having so much fun with this thing. It's it, it, uh, yeah, it's it's so great. It it was weird last night. I walked into the room. And all, and it was, you know, it was nighttime. All the lights were off except the Commodore was was plugged in and on on this monitor that's next to me, and it was on the basic screen, which is kind of the boot up screen for the Commodore 64. And the wall behind me in the darkness was like that shade of blue. It was like you know the the monitor reflecting on the wall and just spreading that color of blue all throughout the room. And I like had this like this like total memory of being a kid walking into mm. my bedroom with a Commodore 64 left on. And it was just, it was like this nostalgia hit at that moment where I was just like, Oh yes. It's, it's just, it's so great. Like when you, nostalgic when you are, deja vu. It's like, I've totally, totally been in this except I'm in a very yeah. different body right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's exactly it. Like that's a great phrase for it. Nostalgic deja vu. That's exactly what it was. So it was very unexpected and awesome. So, anyways, uh, twit.tv slash h o t to check out my review of the C sixty four. Don't forget to wear a mask. Please continue to wear a mask and save lives uh, while you do it. That's it for this week's episode of All About Android. Head over to twit.tv slash AAA. There you can find all the information you need to subscribe to our shows. Yes, please subscribe. Audio, video, doesn't matter. YouTube, you can subscribe there as well. All the links and everything you need to know is at twit.tv slash AAA. But that is it for this week's episode. We'll see you all next week on another episode of All About Android. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hey, folks, I'm Matt Pruitt, host of Hands of Photography here on Twit TV. I know some of you have gotten yourself a brand new camera or you just had a camera sitting around and can't quite figure out how to get the most out of it. Well, I have a solution. My show, Hands on Photography. So subscribe right now to learn how to get the most out of that camera. I'm going to show you how to make those images pop. I don't care if it's a Canon camera. I don't care if it's a Sony, Nikon, iPhone, Android, even an inexpensive Android device. I got you covered. So head on over to twit.tv hop and subscribe today.